Good morning, good morning, Oakland United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Rachel, and it is my joy to be here in this digital space, this virtual space, to worship with you today. As we um, come together in this time, I want to remind you of some of our announcements. We have uh, on our website at olumc.org slash events, uh, a place for you to go and get all the details for things that are coming up in the coming days and weeks. And so please go there and check it out. We also have a worship series that we'll be starting in the new year that we're calling The Crowded Table. I hope that you'll come back and worship with us and see what God has in store for us as a community in the coming year. This is the last week of the year, and I wanted to also let you know that our offices will be closed. If you need to reach out to us, please do so by email, and we, are, we will do our best to make sure that we get to you um, for any of the things that you need. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, I want to invite you to just pause and give thanks to God for the gifts that we have received, the gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love. Thanks be to God. Let us worship together. Developed in the 14th century, the word dwell became known as a lingering abiding. It had connections to inhabit, another word developed at that time. After an Advent and Christmas season of focusing on the barriers that had become thresholds by God, how will we linger and abide within those thresholds? What habits did you invite into your heart in this season that you desire to take with you into the new year? How might we sustain the dwelling, those thresholds, places that feed, house, clothe those who most need it?
Today we light the Christ candle once again that illumines the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May Christ's light awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this end, a threshold to the holy. Please join us in singing our first hymn this morning, number 251. And if you have a hymnal at home, go tell it on the mountain or the words will be on the screen. And as we're singing this hymn, pass the word of Christ to your chosen family in worship around you. Happy day after Christmas. I hope that you had an amazing Christmas day with family and people that you love. And I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning. Now, we spent all Advent season making room for Jesus. Do you remember that? Okay, so we are going to now do our call and response. We've made room for Jesus. He's here and we're so excited. But let's do our call and response that we've done all during the Advent season. Are you ready? Remember how you make room for Jesus? We rub on our hearts. So I will say something and your response is make room for Jesus. Are you ready? 
Make room for family, make room for friends. Make room for Jesus. Make room for love that never ends. Make room for Jesus. Make room for others who need a hand. Make room for Jesus. Make room to listen and understand. Make room for Jesus. Amen. So, you see, we have our box. Now, remember that our box has been a table, a drum, what else? A baby bed, a stable. How about today, we just let it be a box. Did you know that there was a holiday today at, in many countries around the world? It's called Boxing Day. And it's celebrated in countries from Canada to Nigeria to New Zealand. Now, Boxing Day is a day it was started for a way for people to give to people who have less. How cool is that? So today, we're going to experience something like that. Remember that some of you brought toys all during the Advent season, toys that you loved and cared for, and you brought them to give to people who have a little bit less. So in our box, we have just some of the toys that you brought. There's superheroes and trucks and bears, and we have several more that we haven't put in yet. So what we are going to do today is, and if you're a first-time visitor or even if you didn't bring a toy, I want you to experience being able to pray over these so that we can give those to some children who might not have as much as we do. So what I am going to ask you to do is just to extend your hand, and I will put my hand over the box. And then when I say something, I'd like you to repeat after me. Can you do that? All right. So here we go. Loving God, please bless these gifts. We have loved them. And now it's time to share them. So that we may share your love. Amen. So, I am so glad that you joined us for this whole season of Advent, of learning how we, there are many possibilities when we put our hope in Jesus. So as we close out this series, I want you to sing a song with me, kind of like the song we have sung at the very end of every Sunday service. So are you ready? This time I will sing it, and then I'll sing it again, and I hope you and whoever you're with will join in with me. Are you ready? Noel, 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 Jesus is with us, Noel, Noel. You ready to sing that with me? Noel, 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 Noel. Jesus is with us, Noel, Noel. See you next time. Our first reading this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Listen for the word of God. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, 
whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord, and give thanks to God the Father through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. verses 41 through 52. Each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, Child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth. I said Nazareth. All right, but that was good. That was so good. Jesus went down to Nazareth. Okay. And now we're reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, Child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. 
His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years, and in favor with God and with people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas, chosen family. It's great to be with you this morning in this digital worship, celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Emmanuel, God is with us. This morning is our last installment in our From Barriers to Threshold series, and we're going to explore what it means to dwell in this place beyond the threshold. But first, let's begin in prayer. Let us pray. God, your Son has come to earth to dwell with us, and we are so grateful to be your chosen people, loved and cherished. Help us rejoice together in your word this morning. May the meditations of my heart sing with praise this day. Amen. I can't take the credit for making the analogy between our gospel text in Luke this morning with that of the movie Home Alone. While I can't take credit for, for making that analogy, I'm certainly going to take advantage of leveraging it here this morning. I can imagine that parents and kids alike read or hear this scripture and wonder why Jesus' parents would ever have left the city without him. If you think about the movie, the family is in an anxious firestorm to leave their house and city for a Christmas skiing vacation. So frazzled and so hurried, they left the precocious Kevin, or Macaulay Culkin, alone at home. Oh, there were antics, and wow, what a Christmas movie. But the uneasy feeling that the story leaves with us in many of our minds is, wow, yeesh. You have to be pretty frazzled and pretty worked up to forget one of your kids at home. Now, Home Alone is a movie that was meant to sell tickets, and has remained a favorite. It's on every year about this time. And while it's slightly dramatic in its plot, if you think about it, the message is pretty clear. What things do you miss out on in the season because you're in a hurried rush to celebrate? What do you leave behind, maybe even subconsciously, by not taking in the season around you? Are there things you expected to happen or wanted to get from Advent and Christmas that maybe you didn't get? Are there things you can do now in our rest from the season to make up for it? Luke is the only gospel that includes a story about Jesus' childhood. And it's more than a story about a parent's worst nightmare, losing a child. The story in the temple takes us on a transition from the stories about Jesus the infant to the stories of Jesus' public ministry. For much of Luke, Jesus is on a journey to Jerusalem, and this story anticipates that journey as the boy travels from Galilee to Jerusalem. In this story, Jesus speaks his first words in Luke's gospel. He responds to the question his mother asks him. After three or four days of frantic searching, they find him in the temple, and Mary asks, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And his response in verse 49 is, Why have you been looking for me? Didn't you know that I needed to be in my father's house? Very truly, this journey to Jerusalem is not merely a physical journey, but one that mentally and spiritually prepares the boy Jesus for his ministry as an adult among adults. Is Jesus crossing a threshold in this season? I wonder if the Bible translations could label this story literally as Jesus' rite of passage. What we can appreciate that is um, on Mary's mind is not only where her missing son is, but what would have made him want or caused him to separate himself from his parents. And in his response, we hear Jesus speaking of his relationship with his heavenly father, while Mary and Joseph don't quite understand what he's saying. 
remember how they've wondered about this child before. Mary, pondering in her heart about the shepherd's message. Mary and Joseph, amazed at what Simeon had said about Jesus. They do not under, what, that they do not understand shows that Gabriel's announcement to Mary did not explain everything about this son of theirs. And so much has happened since the birth of Jesus, they are likely overwhelmed, like any new parent would be, and this adds one more piece to the puzzle that they will try and figure out. Just as the text ends today, Jesus will mature in wisdom and years. So will clarity come to Mary and Joseph as Jesus matures and claims his ministry. And so clarity will continue to come to us as we mature in our relationship with God. The tension we see in Jesus honoring his relationship with his parents and growing in his relationship with his heavenly father is meaningful to me, as it might be to a few of you as well. It might not be a tension with family, but it could be with friend groups, work groups, social groups. I have experienced instances in my own non-Christian, non-church circles, especially in the gay community, where it can be difficult to express our faith. Similar to the tension we see in this story, others may not quite understand. But as we grow and develop our relationship with God, how we handle that, how we outwardly express who we are as a disciple and follower becomes more clear, even to those around us. That's a part of dwelling on this side of the threshold. Martin Luther said, we are not yet what we shall be, but we are on the way. Let's reflect on the words in our reading this morning from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul says, Now that you are believers in Jesus Christ and part of the body of Christ, put on the new clothes of Jesus Christ. Wear these things that demonstrate who you are now. Wear compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. Clothe yourselves with love. What does that look like in our own lives? Throughout our series, we've been talking about removing barriers and crossing crossing thresholds, and we've done that by talking and learning about prophets who were in exile. In planning for this series, we'd hoped that you'd find some light in the darkness. And while I'll move quickly beyond the Gloria Estefan reference of coming out of the dark, I think it's important to talk about that journey specifically. My eyes are especially sensitive to light, and going from dark to very light and bright spaces can almost be blinding for a few moments. I use that metaphor with you here this morning because I feel the same way about the journey that we've been on for even the past two years, and as we move simultaneously from this season to the next. We've been in some pretty dark places together, and wow, That bright light is very blinding when you come out of it. It can even hurt your eyes for a second. Having outlined for the Colossians the attitudes and practices they should put away in the first part of our passage in in 5 through 9, Paul turns to, to the things that should characterize them. The foundation of his argument is that they should close themselves with these attitudes and practices because of who they are. They are ones whom God has chosen and sanctified. They are people whom God loves. As such, they should become the people who respond to God with gratitude and appreciation. In addition, they should be a group that supports and forgives one another. He adds other qualities to that, that should surround their lives just as clothing surrounds the body. These include humility and patience. Paul weights his focus towards qualities necessary for healthy communal life, like mercy, kindness, gentleness, and again, and supremely, love. He describes love as the yarn out of which perfection is knit. I love that. 
In addition to these external practices, he's concerned about their internal life, both that of individuals and the body of Christ. Be governed by peace and the word, and the word of Christ, and instructed by this word so they'll be able to instruct one another in a wise manner. He tells them to do this in a place in worship as they sing all, all kinds of praise to God. And if, they, and if they only think he's writing about their time together, he reminds them that their entire lives, every word and every deed, should be an expression of thanks to God. So Paul is talking about the things that they do when they are together as a community, as well as, they th as the things they should do in their private spiritual life. I'd like to challenge us this morning to go from this season and carry into the new year the desire to continue to be in community with each other. Get to know each other more deeply. Understand each other. Or heck, just spend time together doing the things that we love to do. If you look around you, you'll see that this is happening in some places. Be a part of that. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. This is not only a list of traits of what it means to be a good disciple. It's a list of the spiritual practices for the people of God. They are compassionate and kind and humble and meek and patient. We not only wear these characteristics like clothes, but we work to embody these practices as part of our very own self. And spiritual practices bear that name for a reason. They take practice. We don't, they don't start easily at first. We practice because there's a standard that we're trying to maintain or a standard that we're trying to attain. What does it take to put on or wear the Christian practices of love and compassion and kindness? It takes hours and hours of practice. And through the gift of being chosen by God, and sustained by God's Holy Spirit, we are to embody these practices, these traits, in response to the amazing grace shown to us in Jesus Christ. These spiritual practices are where we dwell, perhaps even where we rest, across the threshold, beyond a barrier. Christianity is a faith that transforms us and makes us better than we would be if we'd not been gripped by this faith. Every Christian is a, in a way a bearer of Christ or someone who is formed in the image of Christ. My Oklahoma friend might say that, well, she is the spitting image of her, of her mother. And very literally, that is to say that she bears her spirit and image, the imprint of her parent. We believe that Jesus, in his incarnation, enables us to be his spitting image. Coincidentally, she uses mercy sakes quite a bit as well. And, I'm tr and as a Yankee, I'm trying to fit that more into my vernacular as well. Jesus gathered a small group of folks to walk with him during his public ministry, to witness to all that he accomplished. After his death in the light of the resurrection, this small group continued to tell others and show others a new way of living. This way of life spread to other small groups. Be that small group walking with the rest of your fellow chosen family. Be that loved one to your neighbors as you dwell here in the house of God. The Methodist movement was built on small groups or classes, as the Wesleys called them. They met for study and service together. Classes grew until there were classes upon classes. And these, these gr groups changed the world. As we come out of darkness together, we all live together in community. Let us be cloaked with the spiritual practices that we heard about this morning. Let's warm each other and be there for each other. Let's truly turn in our pews, all be them digital pews this morning, and share the love and joy we share for the work of this church and with each other. Let's participate with each other in the opportunities that we have to do so. Let's reflect together on what it means to wear love, to wear compassion, to wear kindness and humility. Let's be patient with each other 
And if God is calling us to dwell together in this place, let's also challenge each other to make change in the world. Let's celebrate the victory that is our work in this church and our world. And for parents or others that are still concerned about why Jesus perhaps got left behind at the temple, during these journeys in that time, these groups of families traveling together did so in small groups. And they were all very close-knit, but small groups nonetheless. Jesus was at the age where his father thought that he might have been with the other group and his mother probably thought the same. My point is that there's an enormous, there was an enormous amount of collective trust among this large group traveling together, all while traveling a large distance in their journey as one. It's our job to help others in our community and in our church family find Jesus when they think they can't find him. It's our job to turn to our neighbors who need us when they need us most. Compassion, kindness, patience, and love are the ingredients for how we do it. There's a sense of accomplishment in reaching the end of a season. There's a special joy in moving from Advent to Christmas and the realization that God is here with each of us. It's been incredibly meaningful for me to be in this season and have this revelation with all of you. Amen. Make of my heart a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. Let us pray. In this moment, we open the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about what we've done and what we've left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. Let us breathe out this regret and breathe in the life-giving, forgiving Spirit of God and out again the Spirit of Christ. Make of my life a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of our lives to the call of the Spirit, inviting us to become more than we could ask or imagine. Let us breathe out our fear and breathe in the courage of the Spirit of God and breathe out again with the peace of Christ. Make of our church a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. And in this moment, we open the doors of our church, filling it with love and compassion, the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. We remember and pray for those who are suffering economic hardship and insecurity in basic needs. May abundance be shared those who are suffering mentally, finding it difficult to cope. May paths open and hope return. We pray for those who are suffering illness or injury. May healing abound. We pray for those suffering loneliness and isolation. May companionship and solace arrive. We pray for those who are suffering discrimination, fear, and violence. May they know respect, respite, and safety. May the advent of compassion be born in us 
reside within us. Move outward from us to meet the needs of the world. Making a house for the holy that is each and every child of God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi. Um, the word is thresholds. And I was trying to think about what that meant at this time of year. Um, last month, I turned 65. And uh, strangely, I was actually looking forward to that. And um, happy to be 65. And I remembered something a phobia that I had since uh, college. I remember when I was in college, I saw a picture of dollar bills being burnt. And I thought, wow, how can you burn a dollar bill? And uh, since then, 40 years since, 45 years since, I've had this tremendous phobia about burning a dollar bill. It seems so wasteful. But I just spent low, low three figures on a Christmas tree, which I'm now going to throw out. So I guess it's not that crazy to burn a dollar bill. Um, so anyway, this is my threshold. I've never done this. Real actual dollar. It's kind of interesting. Whoop. You know, I have a friend who told me that, uh, he said, money is very sincere. And I thought that was one of the most interesting things I ever heard. Money is very sincere. Um, and by that he means money is what it is. And you feel about money how you feel about money. Jesus told a couple of stories. One, uh, they were actually inter interventions. He was sitting at the temple one day. And he saw a rich man come and throw some money in the uh, pot. And, um, and then a, a poor little widow woman came and gave just a few coins. And he said, her gift is better because she came from her substance. And then a, a rich young man came who was very righteous and said, Master, I, I do everything right. What do I need to do to um, obtain the kingdom of God? And he said, you need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the man couldn't do it because he had great wealth. That feeling towards money is very sincere. So this is the offertory message, and I want to say this. My friend is right. Money is very sincere. And how you feel about money is very sincere. Um, we love and we care for this church. And one of the very sincere ways that we can express that love is by giving. Um, it's very important. Um, it takes money to do this. Um, and so I think of sometimes of giving as a form of prayer, and it's the sincerest form of prayer. Like, it was difficult to burn that dollar bill. It's difficult to give to the church, but give to the church. Um, and do it as a prayer, uh, particularly at this wonderful, blessed time of year. Um, you can give cash. You can give a check. Uh, you can give online at olumc.org slash give. Uh, and Cliff in the business office wants me to remind you that um, if you want to get credit for your taxes this year for giving, for the year-end giving, make sure it is, uh, the check is dated and postmarked uh, in 2021. Um, if it's not, we'll still cash the check. Thank you. We end our Advent Christmas worship series with one last Christmas carol, and this one is truly about Christmas Day. Good Christian Friends Rejoice is a medieval carol that would have been used for folk dancing rather than for mass, a more boisterous praise of the newborn child than was permitted in worship at that time. It was written in Latin and German, and the original Latin reveals the heart of the song. In sweet jubilation, now sing and be joyful. The joy of our hearts lies in a manger, 
and shines like the sun in the lap of his mother, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. Let us remember that the joy of our hearts lies in the simplest of mangers. May our church be a lap of the mother for those who need it most. May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already have. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making way for a threshold to the holy. May it be so for you, may it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Amen.